All right, great. Well, I'm happy to have everyone here this morning for our VLAB webinar. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Karen Rennick, who's the Executive Director of the Be Informed Partnership out of the University of Maryland in the Department of Entomology. Um, so Karen, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much for uh, joining us this morning and telling us more about the Be Informed Partnership. Thank you, Denise, for inviting me to be able to speak with you this morning. Um, it's, it's always a little unnerving talking on a webinar because I don't get to see your, your smiling faces. So I'm just going to imagine that we're, we're all having a cup of coffee since it's 9 o'clock in the morning and sitting around my kitchen table and just, just chatting. So, um, so Denise mentioned um, that I am the executive director of the Be Informed Partnership, which is now a nonprofit, and, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail later. Um, I do work with Dennis Van Engelstorp here at the uh, B-Lab. It's his lab here at the University of Maryland. Uh, we work closely together as a team. He is the president of the Be Informed Partnership Incorporated, and I am the executive director. Um, and I hope uh, when, you, when, you're, when we're done talking today that you have a better understanding of, of why we started the Be Informed Partnership and what we do and why we do it and, and what, what you can take away as a beekeeper or I can see um, some master gardeners on here, what you can take away and learn from what we have on our website um, and, and available to you online in, in our very um, open uh, databases. So I want to start first by acknowledging um, that beekeepers are a very, very unique breed of people. Um, and and I, I am a beekeeper. I've been a beekeeper for 10 years, so I, I don't mean certainly to insult anybody, because I know we are all, it, it's a very difficult job. Um, and the farmer's end of things, I, I can't tell you how many car accidents I've been in driving down the road trying to see if the black locust is blooming on the side of the highway as I'm going home from College Park. So, you know, as beekeepers, we're very much in that farmer, farmer end of things. We're, we're looking at what's blooming. When is it going to bloom? Is it going to rain today? Can we get out and work our bees? Um, and then the other end, I think the public thinks that we're crazy. We willingly go into colonies uh, knowing that we're going to get stung, and yet we love what we do, we're passionate about what we do, and we wouldn't change a thing uh, for the world. Now, saying that, uh, because, it, it, and the, the old joke goes, if you get three beekeepers in a room and you ask them a question, you're going to get five different answers. It, it, makes, um, it makes management practices and data analysis just that much more tricky. Um, uh, but we've been able to, to call through a lot of data and I hopefully get some answers to, to all the beekeepers out there. So if I were to just go give the history in, in less than two minutes of the Be Informed Partnership, we were awarded a CAP grant in 2011 uh, by the USDA. It was a five-year, $5 million CAP grant. Written in that grant was that we would become sustainable by the end of the grant. And so after the second or third year of the, of the grant, uh, Dennis and I started meeting with venture accelerator groups on campus. We started really digging into what kind of a, um, um, a sustainability plan or business plan we could have for the Be Informed Partnership to continue what we think the good work that we're doing. Um, af after consulting with some groups, um, we did, took some business classes, and uh, we are now a uh, nonprofit. We are registered in the state of Maryland, but we are recognized by the IRS uh, as a 501c3. And one of the main, other main points that I want to mention is that the grant was originally written with one technical transfer team only. And I'll explain what a technical transfer team is a little bit, a little bit later in this presentation. But just remember in the back of your mind, we, the grant was only written for one, and we currently have five across the country. So our, our end goals were to obviously reduce colony mortality. We wanted to have a better understanding of colony health and that the management practices that beekeepers are using and how does that, how does that uh, predict or, or uh, corroborate their overwintering success. And, and we've been, we looked at traditionally at winter loss. Now we look at summer loss and annual loss as well. Um, the final goal is that we heard a lot from beekeepers saying that you know academics and scientists sit in their ivory towers and it sometimes takes five years or, or longer to get the information back to the beekeepers about what research projects or what research um, experiments they're running. So we were trying to look at something that we could turn around very quickly, get the data back into the beekeepers' hands as quickly as we can, um, and make everything we do very transparent. So those were 
those were kind of our lofty goals as we set forth in the grant. And I think we've, we've done very well in accomplishing them. And, and we want to continue working towards those. So this, this is kind of a, what we started with at the very beginning in 2011. Um, remember, this is coming you know, five years after CCD has happened. Um, people were beginning to realize that beekeeping had become very, very complex, that a lot of beekeepers were leaving the industry because they were losing so many colonies, and that the answer wasn't just one answer. There were many different factors affecting bee colony health. And then we knew that some of the answers were out there. We knew from talking with beekeepers that some beekeepers lost way, way fewer colonies than other beekeepers. So we knew there was something out there that they were doing differently than other beekeepers. And then we also had the premise that nobody really listens to, to anyone unless it affects you, you, you directly. And so the joke we have is that um, if you go into a village and everybody's, it's a fishing village, and everybody fishes with worms. They use worms as their bait, and they're continuing on their livelihood. That's what's always been done and they're going to continue going on to fish. But if someone comes along, a scientist comes along and says, you're going to catch way more fish if you use frogs as bait. And the people in that village would be you know, kind and, and, and understanding. They would nod their head. But you know that they would turn away and continue to use worms as bait until the next morning they go out and see their neighbor who had just started catching fish with frogs. Um, so that directly impacts you. If you see a change being made, something impacting you directly, and you know that change can be attributed to something you're doing, we think that impact is much more powerful than someone just telling you what to do. So that was the whole premise of BIP, is that we would provide data back to the beekeepers to let them make their own decisions. We don't tell anybody what to do, but we just say, here's the data. You can make your conclusions based on your, your management choices to reduce colony loss. So one of, the, one of the other guiding principles is that we're using uh, human health epidemiological methods for this because we, we don't have a lot of uh, in-field in data. We do now with technical transfer teams. But when we started, we knew we, we would have to ask as many beekeepers as possible what they're doing in their colonies over the course of the year and how many colonies they would be losing. So this is very large data set. It's very dirty in, in the terms of epidemiological studies. Uh, and it's the same thing that's used by human health. And I'm thinking here of the Center for Disease Control. This is a, is a graph of, of how AIDS is spreading. Um, and this is by a company who wants to eradicate AIDS by 2030. Um, so we have to look at a lot of data. And the data is dirty data, because it's what people remember they did. And by calling through that, though, we can see significant differences in the management practices of beekeepers that will help reduce colony losses. So we're using these epidemiological methods in all the large survey data that we get. And one thing that, that must be kept, um, kept in mind is that all of the data that I'm going to give you is correlative data. And correlation does not imply causation. Um, there is a lot of correlative data out of there that makes no sense. And, and I give an example for here. There's a study saying that people who have passports have a lower risk of getting diabetes. Well, we know, in fact, that just going out and getting a passport isn't going to automatically lower your chance of, of getting diabetes. But there's probably other factors involved. Perhaps um, people who travel probably have a little bit more spending income. Maybe they eat better. They get more exercise. So there are a lot of other uh, risk factors that are associated with um, this data. And so we must be very careful not to, real, to realize that by doing this one thing, I'm automatically going to have this happen to me. It's all correlative. It's not causative. And because we see along the regions of the country that there's great differences in how beekeepers keep bees in the north and the south, in, the, say, the, the mid-Atlantic, the northeast, the northwest, and so forth. We have to take into account those, those microclimates in those different regions of the country. OK, so why, why did we start this, the Be Informed Partnership? As I already mentioned, we knew that there were management practices out there that, that showed uh, much more successful beekeeping than others. And just this past year, if you're familiar with our, our annual loss survey, uh, the annual total loss of colonies in the United States was 44%, which is a shocking number. Um, if you think about that across other types of animal husbandry, if you, we lost 44% of the cows or 44% 40%, 40 
of the pigs in the country, this would be just a shocking number. Beekeepers are very good at making up new colonies, and we're seeing that that they're 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 compensating for this loss that they get throughout the year by making many more splits in the spring and summer than they used to because they know they're going to lose this many colonies. And uh, this is just a quote from from John Miller, if any of you know him. He's a commercial beekeeper in North Dakota, and you know there's there's roughly two and a half, two point seven million colonies in the country, but there's only about fifteen hundred. Uh, to 2,000 commercial beekeepers who really are uh, the gatekeepers of our national food security. So this becomes an issue much more on a national level as we enjoy the variety of fruits and vegetables and nuts. So again, China emphasizing why do we care and why should the, 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 the nation care and why should even people who aren't beekeepers care? Um, this is a, a pretty telling uh, illustration of the value of honeybees ranked third in the economic ranking of agricultural products, and here just just you know just behind uh, cattle and swine, the value of honeybees is rated you know 15 to 18 billion dollars nationwide, or attributable to bees, and this is based on the pollination services that they provide, again to give us that great range of variety of food that we enjoy. So how 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 is the Bee Informed Partnership gathering all this data, and what data are we gathering? Um, this is a kind of just a, a cartoon version of what we, while well, the projects and outreach efforts we have going on, um, in the upper left-hand corner, we'll talk about this in more detail right after this, is on the ground uh, sample collection that these are the technical transfer teams working with about 90 to 100 commercial beekeepers uh, nationwide. Um, they go out and sample the colonies, they assist the, the commercial beekeepers in their management practices. Uh, just below that, all of the samples, if you're involved in any of our Sentinel apiary projects or um, in the National Honeybee Survey or in the technical transfer teams, all of those samples come back to our central diagnostic lab, which is here at the University of Maryland. And we process anywhere between 16 and 18,000 samples a year. So it's a, it's a lab that's running full time um, uh, pretty much every day of the year, except for those, those major holidays. Um, we also have in the lower left hand corner, we are the ones who the lab who runs the national APHIS National Survey, which is a survey that samples from roughly about 42 uh, random states in the country in a year just to get the base threshold of colony health. And we look at uh, nosema, varroa, some pests and pathogens, pesticides, and uh, about six or seven honeybee viruses. Um, in the lower middle, uh, that's if you're if you're familiar with seeing that graph, we do. Uh, produce the National Loss Survey and the Management Survey that goes live in April every year. Uh, we have about uh, eight or nine, ten years of data um, that we consistently track um, the losses across the country, and that's published usually in May. In the lower right-hand corner, if you're, if you're any size beekeeper, you can participate in our Sentinel Apiary Project, which is a really exciting new project we started a couple years ago. Um, to actually be a sentinel in, in every region in the country. And we have a little bit over 150 of those sentinel apiary uh, projects going across the country. And then finally, um, you, which is if you're a beekeeper, you're one of our more important data contributors. Um, if you take the management survey every year, um, and we ask you, I think it's up to 180 some questions, it's an onerous survey. And if, if you've taken it, we thank you greatly for your time. Um, it, it, Varying from what you treat, how do you treat, what do you feed, how much honey you take off, uh, why do you keep bees, how long have you keep bees, and that's the that's the big epidemiology data that we were talking about earlier uh, that we call through to to correlate with the losses that we see. And then that brain in the center is our database. So it's the it's the BIP database that we use to um, mine for answers that we hope we can get back to the bee. And this is just a, a, a cute graphic that I'm showing that, you know, I think every beekeeper would agree there are two tools you can't live without, and that's a hive tool and a veil. Um, smoker would probably be the, the third one. But more and more, I think we're starting to see um, computers being used that we're able to put things online that help beekeepers. We write blogs about brood diseases and, and all kinds of interesting things. So. Beekeepers are able to use their computer now as a resource and a tool for their beekeeping 
um, almost as much as any other thing that they take out in the field. And now with the advent of smartphones, um, I think a lot of more beekeepers are even tracking their colonies that way. So um, definitely a big evolution in how we keep bees. Going back to the database, I just want to introduce our database team. These are a group of core group of just a few individuals that have been just so uh, pivotal in helping us get this database out there. Um, on the left, upper left, you see Michael Wilson. He's from the University of Tennessee. He works in Dr. John Skinner's lab. Um, in the lower the lower left-hand corner is Dr. James Wilkes out of Appalachian State University. He is the he is the head of the computer department there, and we've been able to work with many of his grad students and undergrads to help us with this database. And then in the upper right-hand corner is Dr. Jonathan Engelsma from Grand Valley State University in Michigan. Um, who has been, uh, who has jumped on board in the last three years to help us with the Sentinel Apiary. Um, he's a great, great addition, great asset to our team. So it's, it's what, when I show you the database and, and the reports and the outputs that we have, it's, it's attributed to these three individuals and, and they've done a stellar job. Okay, so we've talked about some of the projects um, that contribute to the database and can give back to the beekeeper. And this is just a listing of, of what we've already talked about in, in text form rather than picture form. And this is, we're gonna, we're gonna walk through these in the next few slides. So as you can imagine, in the beekeeping community, um, there are, are lots and lots of backyard beekeepers. And if we look at our survey, and you look at the graph on the right, about 90%, 96% of the respondents are what we would call backyard or small-scale beekeepers. These are people who have one to 50 colonies, and they represent about 2% of all the colonies in the country. Um, and, the, and the dark area next to that, to the right of that, is are the what's representative as the commercial beekeepers. So these are beekeepers who own and manage more than 500 colonies, and this is only they are only about 2% two to three percent of the beekeepers in the country, yet they manage about uh, 95 percent of the colonies in the country. So when we started the Bee Informed Partnership, we knew we had to address those beekeepers that were managing the vast majority of the colonies in the United States. And to do that, um, we started what we refer to as technical transfer teams. And if you remember from my one of my very first slides, uh, when the grant was originally written, we only were funded for one technical transfer team and that was the technical transfer team you see in Northern California um, based out of the University of California Cooperative Extension. That's in Chico, California. Um, but we saw how valuable it was and how um, the demand for, from other commercial beekeepers in the country. So we were able to leverage that funding by having the beekeepers begin to pay for services, pay a fee for service, um, meanwhile still be subsidized by the grant we could leverage that by using that some of that funding and starting other technical transfer teams um, in the areas that the beekeepers requested. Uh, the next team that was started was the Midwest team that's run out of Marla Spivak's lab at the University of Minnesota. And then after that was a Florida Georgia team uh, down in J Dr. Jamie Ellis's lab at the University of Florida. And then um, the uh, Pacific Northwest team at Oregon State University run out of Dr. Ramesh Sagili's lab. So we now have five technical transfer teams uh, working with uh, those commercial migratory beekeepers in those regions. And then you can see the red dot is our central processing lab. Again, those were all the samples come uh, and get processed and, and the reports generated and returned to the beekeepers. So one thing I want to, I want to it's kind of eye-opening if, if you're familiar with uh, um, commercial beekeeping, you know that commercial beekeepers migrate because the, the, the crops that they pollinate don't move. The beekeepers have to move, go into them. So they're trucking thousands of miles across the country um, to try to pollinate crops. If you're a beekeeper on the East Coast, you know, you're, you're, you're going down to possibly Florida. Um, you're, you're coming up to Maine for um, blueberries, Massachusetts for cranberries, uh, New York and Pennsylvania for apples, possibly in Maryland and Pennsylvania for melons and cucumbers. Um, so you're traveling great distances. And I just wanted to showcase, you know, if you, if you superimpose the United States over on Europe, that if you're a Maine beekeeper and you're traveling to California to pollinate almonds, you're now in the, you know, the territory of Russia going all the way to Ireland. So just a staggering um, amount of mileage that is being put on these bees and just huge 
long migration routes for these beekeepers. So I think just to put it into context of the actual scale of how how much uh, my, you know miles and area our beekeepers cover, it's it's important to kind of see that in the scope of say if we just uh, put it over a couple countries in Europe. So these tech teams are what we call the are they're the they're certainly the 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 heart and eyes and hands of the Bee Informed Partnership. They're on the ground working every day with commercial beekeepers. Um, they're they're evaluating and assessing assessing colony health and usually going into the colonies when the beekeeper themselves do, knows that they should be in there but they just don't have time. Commercial beekeepers are incredibly busy, have many many um, areas where their time is needed and our tech teams usually go in there as, as an extra set of hands going into the colonies that the beekeeper wants them to look at or saying just I just need you to check this yard let me know what you find the beekeeper the commercial tech teams then take the sample send them back to Maryland and we're returning reports to the beekeeper to the operation so that they can make near real time management decisions on those colonies and they're giving them actionable information do they need to treat do they need to feed is a colony queenless um, so they're very trusted partners with the commercial beekeepers. Our tech teams usually work with about 20 to 25 commercial beekeepers per team. Um, after that, it, it, their, their time is a little stretched because they also have to uh, follow the migratory routes where these bees are too. So a lot of our tech teams will move into almonds in February um, and, and do the sampling there. So this just gives another another um, example of all the results in the type of data that they're taking. Um, our tech teams usually go in before the beekeepers treat, and then they'll do sampling post-treatment to make sure the treatments worked, um, and then they help them assess the colonies as they prepare for winter. Um, some of our, our uh, commercial beekeepers are uh, queen breeders, so we will help with hygienic testing um, in the spring before they start breeding queens. Some of them actually do hygienic testing in the fall, and that's actually happening right now in Northern California. So when they go through a colony, they'll look at the, the configuration, how many deeps, how many mediums, if there's supers on them. They'll look at the queen status. Uh, we count frames of bees. We give a general uh, a weight, a brood pattern, and then certainly if you're breeding queens, we'll look at temperament, color, um, and, and disease resistance as well. So these are just the pictures. These are six of our technical transfer teams, um, again, in the five different areas of the country. And that's Katie Lee from Minnesota. Uh, from left to right, Dan Wines from Oregon. That's Ellen Toppetshofer in Oregon. Uh, Rob Snyder down on the lower, lower left from California. Megan Mahoney in Texas, and uh, Ben Solomon in California. So I just want to get a kudos to them. They do a tremendous amount of work. Um, for the first time this year, we were able to go back through our loss uh, data and separate those commercial beekeepers that work with technical transfer teams versus those who do not. And uh, we were very, very pleased to see that our technical transfer teams are making a, a, a huge impact on the losses for commercial beekeepers. So those commercial beekeepers that work with technical transfer teams actually lose around 36% fewer colonies annually, annually. And if you had a 2,000 colony operation, which is, is, which is about average, that means that we're saving 300 colonies a year. And if you conservatively estimate a colony worth at $250, that's over $74,000 a year that we're saving the commercial beekeeping industry. And it, and it doesn't just come down to monetary savings. That means there are that many more pollinator units available um, in, in almond orchards, in, in, in you know, watermelon, in, in all the type of pollination services that are out there. So we're making an impact on the, the larger agricultural picture in the United States. And then just another slide showing that uh, if you take on average, the commercial beekeepers were losing a little bit over 3% of colonies each month. Again, at $250 a colony and a 2000 colony operation, that's representative of $15,000 if, if the losses are sustained. So just a staggering amount of losses for commercial beekeepers if, if things continue the, the way they are. So I wanted to give, I know most of you are probably not commercial beekeepers, but I just wanted to give you an example of what a report would be for, for a commercial beekeeper. 
Um, here we break down in the top the top table. We give them, um, and, and they usually have yard names. We're just calling this yard one and yard two. Here you can see the Varroa average for yard one and yard two. We give them a range um, of the samples that we've taken, as well as nosema. There's frames of bees in the range of frames of bees. And the nice thing about the technical transfer teams is they can follow colonies throughout the year. So those colonies you see highlighted in yellow are historic colonies. So those are the, the most recent uh, data for that colony. And then all the, the lines below that, before you hit another yellow, um, another highlighted yellow field, is the historic data for that colony. So the BP keepers can see, say if he treated for Varroa, did that treatment make a difference? Because he's the technical transfer teams are going there in there repeatedly, usually four times a year, to sample that colony. Um, so he has real-time data. He knows if a treatment, a feeding um, worked. He can see if there's any type of disease that they're picking up, see if it's queenless, how many frames does he need to feed to up his frame count. Um, so there's really nice data that we're getting back to the beekeeper. Um, if you can see, it's kind of hard to see. When it goes, when the values of Nozema or Varroa go above an actionable threshold, those numbers are highlighted in red. So if you were to look at the graph, um, you'll see that um, there is one um, column that shows a, a number three that is red. So that is just above threshold for Varroa mites. And that would give him an, an indication that he probably needs to take some management decisions on, those, on, the, on that specific colony. Just to give you an example, um, this was a, a, a team working with some beekeep, uh, commercial beekeepers in June 2012. The team had just begun, and these were the beekeepers. They're listed as A through L below. Um, all our data is anonymized and confidential, uh, but the beekeeper, when he gets a report, it will indicate which letter he is or she is. Uh, but here you can see when the team started working with this group of beekeepers in this region, the average for the varroa mites was about 1.7 across all of the operations. And you can see that four had exceeded what we consider the threshold of three mites per 100 bees. And then we take a look at the data from the following year after the tech teams had been working with them. The average is now down to you know, roughly a third of it was the, the year before, and that none of the beekeepers are above that actionable threshold. So a great success in that region. Um, here's another example uh, for varroa levels for another team in 2014 uh, versus 2015. So here you can see in June and August, um, pretty high mite levels. Um, lots of colonies above the actionable threshold of three. And then if we move to um, June of 2015, um, those mite levels, as well as August, have gone down considerably over the, over the, the course of that year. Um, this is just a slide to show the lab processing uh, that we do at the University of Maryland. So on the left is what we call, it's our Varroa shaker. It's actually a, a, a mechanized wrist shaker. Um, that we take the samples and shake for 30 minutes and screen all the varroa mites out. And then we're able to count how many varroa mites were in the sample. Um, and that's, when we're busy, that's going, that's going nonstop throughout the day for weeks on end. And on the right is just a microscope showing uh, our hemocytometer as we count uh, nosema spores. And this is Heather, Heather Eversall, our lab manager. She's actually counting bees in that picture. And she's the one who runs the lab and keeps things moving. She does an excellent job. And just to show you, again, our improvement as we, we, we try to get better every year, we, we handle more and more samples every year. This is a, a, just a real quick um, chart showing the turnaround time um, when we get a sample in from the lab. So back in 2014, uh, once a sample was taken, it was, it was shipped to us, and then we turned around a report to the beekeeper. So back in 2014, from the time that sample was taken, so we got a report out was 11 days. In 2016, we're, we've reduced that by three days. We're now um, turning a report around within eight days. Uh, four of those days are from when we actually receive the sample. So there's some, some delay in sometimes getting um, the samples to us. As you can imagine, some of our, B, our technical transfer teams are in pretty remote areas, and they have a hard time finding a post office or a FedEx office. So there's some delay in getting the samples to us. But we're turning around the samples certainly within you know, under two weeks, which has always been our goal. Um, for those of you who have taken our survey, this is probably not um, 
not too foreign to you. It probably looks pretty familiar. Um, this is our management survey and our loss survey. And again, all this data goes into feed what, what, what you normally see for the, the, uh, the winter loss and the summer loss and the annual loss reports that we generate every year. So this is, this is typically what you're used to seeing. All of our loss reports and our management reports are on our website, uh, available to everybody. Um, another exciting thing that we've been able to get on the website, and I've pulled, I've pulled this off since I know this was based out of Ohio. This is, we've just uploaded last year's data from 2015, 2016 losses. So this shows the state of Ohio. Um, you can get there by going to the bip2.beinformed.org. You can look through um, all the states for all years that we have lost data. And if you hover over the state, you can see that Ohio had a little bit over 43% total annual loss last year. You can see how many beekeepers participated, how many colonies they managed. A lot of really great data uh, for all of the states. And it's a heat map. You can see um, Ohio's in orange, but there's a state, that obviously, to, to um, well, you'll see that there are some, some that are red states that are even higher losses than Ohio. Um, so it kind of gives you a heat map every year, and you can see um, those regions of the country that were hit harder than others by the losses. So feel free to please um, take a moment and, and go there and, and play around with the data. Um, we do have all our, I think I mentioned, our monofactorial reports online. So this is, uh, again, uh, correlating management practices with losses. And this is a picture of our website, and I want to show you this is where we get to put our thinking caps on and be scientists. This is what our typical uh, monofactorial reports used to look like. I'm going to show you what we've gone to recently. Um, this is a typical report that we had uh, showing that did you immediately or did you treat your dead out equipment once you found it? Uh, and those beekeepers who immediately used equipment lost far fewer colonies and significantly fewer colonies than those who stored their equipment for later use. And this is uh, four consecutive years. Uh, running now. So I'm just showing you the types of reports. That, they're still on the website, but we have a new data, data explorer that I'll show you in the next slide um, that lets you play with the data even more. Uh, this is one that we hope to have a bigger impact on, um, the Varroa control products. Every year we've asked this question, and, and we are shocked to see how many, how many beekeepers do not use a Varroa control product on their colonies. And we've seen this number actually go down, so we think we are making an impact. But in this, in this slide, it shows 58% of beekeepers do not use a Varroa control product on their colonies at any point in the year. And again, four consecutive years running, that shows that if you do, you, you lose significantly fewer colonies than if you didn't. So those are, those are the, the, the type of monofactorial reports we've been using for the last couple years. And this next slide, is what we have gone to and is, is now available on the website. And we're calling it our Data Explorer. So if you go to the bip2.beinformed.org, you can actually um, see, and you have pull-down menus on different management practices. And then again, this is available for anybody. So we, we hope that uh, individual beekeepers, beekeeping clubs start using this. Um, this combines all the data we have taken in the last six or seven years. So there's a huge amount of data that goes behind this. Um, in this question, I just wanted to show you an example. And it says, I want to know what is the correlation of different control products on colony loss. And there's a scroll down menu. You can pick lots of different products. You can pick all of the products even. Um, I picked Formic just because I know that's one that we, a lot of beekeepers like to use, and it's an organic product. Um, and then in the graph down below, you can see that those beekeepers who used Formic acid lost significantly fewer colonies than those who did not use that product or did not use any of the products. Um, so really interesting um, a way to play around with the data. It lets you choose those products or those management practices that are familiar to you or that you think are making a difference. And it gives you kind of, you get to be the scientist. You get to play around with the data and be the researcher and see what is making a difference. What can I use in my own yard? Um, what can our club adopt? So this is all out there now. It's completely transparent, open. Nobody, you don't need a login. You don't need a password. It's just on our database uh, for everybody to use. So we're really excited about this. Um, I'd love to hear feedback from you. It's, it's fairly new. Um, so yeah, we, we look forward to, to seeing more people use it and, and get feedback from you on what would be helpful. And one of the things I mentioned, one of our projects and outreach projects that, that any beekeeper can use is the Sentinel Apiary. 
Uh, some of you may be members of this. This is where we have a hive scale in a yard, and we're asking you to take disease or, or sample your colonies six months out of the beekeeping year. Um, and you send the sample to the University of Maryland, and we send back the data to you. Uh, this is a map. This is not an updated map. It doesn't show all 150, but we have 150 uh, scales out there working with the Sentinel Apiary Program um, in the different regions of the country. And I'm just going to move along quickly here. I see my time is, is running down. Um, the uh, part of the Sentinel project is taking monthly samples, like I said, for six months, where you go in and scoop the bees, you send it to Maryland. All the kits have everything that you need. Um, this is a really popular project for clubs because that gives them a regional view of what's happening in, in their area. They can see when the nectar flow starts. They can possibly see when, when, when warming begins. They can watch their disease, disease loads and then make management decisions uh, based on the data. It's all data driven. Uh, we've talked about lab processing already. Um, this is a monthly report for the Sentinel Apiary. So this is really important. I want to show you, this is one beekeeper. And, and we ask you to take eight samples. So this is eight samples, one through eight. Um, here you can see in July on his very first, his very first um, sample that it's highlighted in red. And that's because it is above the actual threshold of three mites per 100 bees. It does look like the beekeeper treated in August, and that number went down. But then you can see the mites start to elevate in September and October. Um, another, let's see, yeah, August we treated. October, the mites are really high. We do give him some other baseline uh, threshold data that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and that's the national, the APHIS National Honeybee Survey. So if we go back, this, this USB, the one that's highlighted in yellow, we have um, data going back since 2009 in uh, most regions of the country where we can give baseline uh, health data. So we can compare the averages, even though his mites were at 5.8, the, the national average at that time was 6.13. So he's a little bit below average, but both of those numbers are still above the actionable threshold. So our lab does, does participate. We do run the APHIS National Survey. So we have yet another database of, of data available to share to beekeepers and give them um, information on what is, is, is typical for their region. And I'm just going to go through this real quickly. Again, this is all on our database. Uh, this is all available to anybody. It gives you the states and the, the uh, if, you, if you hover over a state, it will give you the Varroa and Nozema average for that year. Or, and then you could scroll down and it has the different years that you can pull down. As we move forward, it also has, we collect pesticide data for every state that participates. So here you can see um, the pesticide category distribution for all years on the left, and a pie graph, and then the pesticides for this specific state on the right. Um, so if you're interested, all of that data is, again, available at bip2.beinformed.org on our research site. And this is an example. This is the graph showing that beekeeper that showed um, or, or a beekeeper that showed his, his month in August, his varroa mites were much lower than anybody else participating in the project. And as we step through, um, we're going to skip over Nozema. Um, maybe I didn't include that. Here you can see where the yellow arrow is, his, his varroa mite levels were extremely low. And then September, he's still doing very well. If you look, he's the dark green uh, bar chart. And then as you notice, in October, his varroa mites just go through the roof. And we think this is, this is happening. He was probably keeping his mites really low, that there was probably another crashing colony nearby in his region that may have reinfested his colony. Or in this case, maybe the brood, um, the brood size shrunk, and there's just more phoretic adult mites on the bees. So um, really interesting data. October is a critical time for watching varroa mites in honeybees. I'm just going to skip through some of these. Um, as we talked about, uh, varroa mites are critical for, for maintaining colony health. You have to keep their population under control. We started a project called Mite Check in combination with the University of Michigan and University of Minnesota. Um, you can go to bip2.beinformed.org, Mite Check. And um, this, is, this, is one of the, uh, this is one of the reasons why we started the Mite Check program. If you can see, this is all all data from the APHIS National Survey. And you can see there are five months of the year 
that exceed the actionable threshold for varroa mites. Um, the important thing here to note is those months, uh, month one is January, just for example, so month eighth would be um, August. So here you see July, August, September, October, and November, all of those um, data show that the mites are above actionable threshold. And those are the critical months when you are breeding winter bees. It's really important to keep those mite levels low so that you can have healthy bees to make it through the winter into the spring. So this was alarming when we saw this. We started the mite check program to make it easy for backyard beekeepers um, to, to do sugar rolls or ether rolls or alcohol washes um, to monitor mite checks, enter the data into this website, and you can see um, different areas of the, of the country where people have entered. You can see if there's hot spots, if, if you're in a county that is experiencing um, high mite levels, um, and this, this shows you the data, that how many mites per 100 bees. Did the beekeeper do anything? Um, drone code removal, if they did a treatment, and then the type of mite treatment. So, um, again, this is all available on our website. Um, I think we've talked, we, if you're a beekeeper, you're familiar with this, that we measure mite levels, and you manage the mites based on the results and the time of year. There's lots of options for doing that, um, from you know, just drone brood removal, very organic practices, to miticides that are also organic, or if you want to use hard chemicals, those um, options are available to you. And then we ask everybody to also measure the mite levels after you've treated to see if your treatment works. These are the powdered sugar roll kits that we sell. They're available at the University of Minnesota Bookstore and at Man Lake. Um, so if you want to participate in the MiteCheck program, you do not need to buy one of these kits. If you have your own sugar roll kit, that's fine. We also have on our website where you, how you can make them yourself. So we get down to um, how, do, how does this all help you? Um, hopefully, as a, as a beekeeper, if you're a small scale or sideline or commercial beekeeper, you see all aspects of the data that, that we have available to help you make decisions. Um, we have many outreach projects that can, you can participate that we encourage you to join. Um, the more the merrier. We are thrilled to have new beekeepers join our Sentinel Apiary projects. Um, if, you, um, if you go on our website and play with any of our data explorers or look at our state reports, we'd love to hear back from you um, to improve or add more things that make your life easier or that would be more relevant to your type of beekeeping. Um, you definitely can see the, the pest and pathogen loads in your region. Um, and you get to be part of the bigger community that is helping um, improve colony health in the country. So very excited to have, have new folks join and to get feedback from you. Uh, this is just a kind of a kudos to our, our lab, our grad students, USDA personnel that we work with. I also wanted to put a quick plug. We are hiring for our technical transfer teams. We're starting up some new teams and filling some slots in some teams where we need an extra person. If you know of anybody who has qualifications uh, that enjoys working with beekeepers and honeybees, let me know. Um, that's my email um, on, on this slide. We're taking applications until next Friday, September 30th. So um, please feel free to spread the word if you know anybody who would be interested or, or you think would be a great match for that. Uh, they can contact me directly. And I just wanted to go back to the the very first slide where we acknowledge that um, we're a unique mix of people, but we're all in this together. And I think the more we all, the more information we provide each other, the more access we can have to the data. And, and we're always refining and improving um, what we're finding, trying to quickly turn it around to all of you. And just to acknowledge that we are a community as diverse as we are, um, but we're a special community and one that's very important to, to all of the, the nation's agricultural. Um, uh, economics. So I want to just give a, a last shout out to the thank you for our for our funding sponsors. Um, I think that's the last one. Yes. Okay, great, Karen. Thank you so much. Um, we have a couple questions coming in already. So let me start with Alan, who asks if there's any uh, plan or chance to make your database or part of the da database available to the public for research or for other researchers to use. So yes, um, we do have plans in place. We have actually quite a few grad students using it right now that are working at the various institutions around the country. Um, but we certainly, that is, that is actually one of our top, um, top items on our agenda this year is to get 
uh, access to researchers. We've just opened it up to um, uh, a group of researchers at Cornell Labs at the state of New York, and we've just opened it up to the state apiarist in Texas uh, for their own. They're, they're going to use it as their own data repository, but also adding the data into the FIP, FIP database. So that is definitely a, a, a key, key goal for this year. Okay, great. Swarmcatcher asks about packages and Varroas as being a vehicle for movement of, of Varroa across the country. And if you have any comments or suggestions about how that can be managed or maybe is being managed? Yes. If you had asked me this five years ago, I, I, I would have never thought it was a problem. But at the University of Maryland, we, we have seen it in the packages that we've brought. And our what we are going to move to next year is treating those packages as soon as we install them. So we're installing usually in late March, early April. Um, I, I would almost do, you know, do a sugar roll as soon as you get the package, as soon as you install them. If you see mites are high, then I would go ahead and treat. We're going to try to do a treatment um, immediately next year. So I, I agree. It is, a, it is a, a problem that we're seeing elevated every year. Great. And you mentioned that your um, tech teams are expanding. Are those geographic expansions? Or are you adding more teams in the locations where you're already working? Yeah, so we're adding, some of our teams are, are a team of one. <laughs> so so um, we're hoping to get those teams a second person. And then we're also thinking of possibly uh, adding two new teams, one here in the Northeast and one possibly in, let's just say, the Northern Midwest. Okay. Uh, great. And so there's a follow-up question about the package treatment and whether you have uh, suggestions for what kind of treatment, or does that kind of vary, or will that be a part of uh, maybe the information that goes into your database? Yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, it all depends on what region of the country you are in. So much of those treatments now uh, are very temperature dependent, so I would look at what region you're in and whether or not you're in, you're going to be in that temperature range for treating, and then use the appropriate product for 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 whatever region or temperature range you're in. But yeah, excellent question. Okay, great. And then Alan, maybe you can elaborate in the chat pod. Alan has a question about the pesticide and herbicide use versus colony loss, and maybe uh, Karen, maybe he's asking if you've been able to correlate the uh, pesticide use or pesticides that you're finding, and I'm inferring that's from pollen. Or is that from wax in your data? Yes. Yeah, so, so um, again, another good question. All of the data that we have online for our pesticide has been from pollen and bee bread. We have noticed that wax is probably going to be a better indicator of the long-term pesticide usage in that colony or the pesticide accumulation in the colony. And that includes both the varroa sites that the beekeeper is putting in, in addition to what the bees are actually bringing back to the colony. So right now, the data on the database is for bee bread and pollen only. I think this next year for the APHIS National Survey, we're going to actually move to wax samples, and we should make that, we should make that very clear on our website. Um, I think Dennis just released a paper um, uh, about that has, it just, um, if Alan's able to get me his email, I can send him the paper that, that came out where they tracked commercial beekeepers up and down the East Coast, and it had the breakdown of of herbicides, pesticides, fungicides. Um, the thing that we're seeing is a lot more fungicides um, are in the colony than we ever imagined. And those, those fungicides are labeled as safe for use by honeybees, but we're seeing a direct correlation with the amount of fungicides and colony mortality. 